awesome session. Uh, we are going to talk about um, social aspects of empirical software engineering. My name is Alexander Srebrenik. I'm from Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, and I will be chairing the session. Our first speaker today uh, is going to be Professor Audrey Smokos, who is going to talk to us about the effect of technical and social factors on pull request quality for the NPM ecosystem. We slightly deviate from the program, uh, but we will give uh, another opportunity for the paper about Timberg to present their results. Audrey, if you are ready, without further ado, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Audrey Smotskos, uh, and uh, this paper uh, called Effects of Technical and Social Factors in Pull Request Quality for NPM Ecosystem uh, was actually mostly done by Tapajit, uh, but he's uh, uh, on the, in the process of moving uh, from the University of Tennessee to Lira in uh, Limerick, and uh, uh, because of some technical difficulties, uh, he he wasn't sure that he'll be able to present. So uh, so just keep it in mind that uh, that I'm just uh, second author here. Uh, he worked with me for a number of years uh, and 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 did a lot of interesting things. So let's. Uh, uh, so I'm um, I'm professor at the University of Tennessee. I've been there for five years, and he's uh, Tapajit was my guess, first uh, PhD student there. So um, pull request based development is is kind of a new um, fashion. Uh, it's really the same thing as uh, code inspection, except that it has a uh, you know more sophisticated tool and more sophisticated name uh, attached to it. Um, despite all the convenience of the tool um, that allows you to sort of keep the, the code submission uh, convenient, uh, updated with the current code from upstream, uh, add uh, fixes, uh, uh, take into account comments. Um, there are often so many of these pull requests, especially for more popular projects, that uh, it's kind of difficult to decide which ones uh, to prioritize from the maintainer's perspective. Um, from the contributor's perspective, it also becomes a challenge because how do you kind of say, hey, look, this uh, is... Alders, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Um, you're, you're sharing, I think, the wrong screen. We are seeing a terminal. Could you please um, oh, okay. share uh, the, the slides, please? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so let me see. So let me stop screen sharing. And then let me try again, uh, share screen. Uh, Scratch uh, is easiest with two. Okay, so let me try again. Uh, select window, select, uh, okay, so I do this. Uh, let me try screen and, and see. Uh, so when I share the screen, for some reason it shares the terminal. Um, virtual session, StreamYard, README, Zoom, resume. Uh, Okay, let me, oh, entire screen, sorry, I found it. Entire screen, allow, and then uh, uh, please let me know it's, if it's working now. Hello? Yeah, it's working now. Okay, working sorry, now. I just didn't pick the right. So anyway, so um, anyway, so I stopped on the fact that, you know, PR contributors want to kind of indicate, uh, have some ways of, of manipulating essentially maintainers to pay attention to their uh, pull requests so that they can get their bug fixed. And of course, the third uh, uh, audience for this work might be tool designers that, you know, make these PR tools, PR acceptance review uh, production tools as well. Um, and uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this talk, we kind of use uh, quality of PR loosely. Uh, we basically assume that whatever has been merged, it was good. Whatever it wasn't, uh, was not, even though that's obviously somewhat uh, subjective. Okay, so um, so we want to uh, first verify previous work, extensive work in this area, uh, but we wanted to focus on specifically NPM ecosystem and see if the previous models of PR acceptance work. Uh, we wanted to check our hypotheses uh, and, it, and also identify important uh, relative importance of each predictor. So 
uh, if you were to do something, what should you pay attention either from maintainer's perspective or PR contributor's perspective? And then try to understand if some of these measures that are predictors of PR acceptance, whether they really linearly in increase the, the chances of acceptance or maybe too much of something is, is really bad. So, and then there's maybe a U-shaped or, uh, or, uh, or inverted cup shape. So here's the NPMO ecosystem study. There's quite a bit of data. I would uh, uh, I'd like you uh, to take a look at the paper to get some idea of what's there. So first we list all NPM packages. Uh, for, uh, then we sort of uh, obtain the issues for these, uh, for these packages, uh, obtain also a subset of issues that are pull requests. Uh, then we get information about the uh, IDs of the pull request creators. And then uh, for these pull request creators, we want to understand what their uh, actual professional career is, not just what they did on NPM, but uh, evaluate their entire career, that is what projects they participated and so forth. And we use world of code data that contains uh, all, uh, you know, cross-reference data of, uh, from all the software, open source software projects. And, uh, and then we put all this data together into a single model and try to do the prediction of future pull request acceptance based on the past history. Okay, so that's kind of a short summary of the, uh, of the, of the data. Uh, here are hypotheses. Um, and so the first hypothesis is that some specific technical characteristics of a PR accept, uh, uh, affect its acceptance probability. And, uh, and we basically look at how much code is added, how much deleted. So this, uh, this, this thing has been studied quite a bit. And we can see that the additions, commits, uh, uh, whether it's a fix, uh, are uh, these three things uh, have actually statistically significant impact on the acceptance. Uh, in particular, additions, the bigger things are less likely to be accepted. Uh, the more commits in the PR, the less likely it's going to be accepted. And then uh, uh, the bug fixes tend to be more likely to be accepted than non-bug fixes. Um, not surprising, uh, that sort of more or less verifies prior work. Uh, other hypothesis is the social proximity between the PR creator and the repository to which it's, uh, it is created also increases PR acceptance. So this basically says that, well, if you know people from the, uh, the you know, if you worked with people uh, on the directory to which you're on the repository to which you're committing this PR, that would increase the chances of acceptance. And again, we see that, that, that pretty huge effect and it's, um, uh, it's statistically significant as well. Uh, uh, our third hypothesis is, uh, is basically a track record. Everybody knows that uh, that uh, as a maintainer, you know, and as a, as a contributor, you know, that if you have been able to uh, have uh, PRs accepted in the past, uh, not just for the specific project you're submitting it, but more generally, that sort of in general like increases the pro uh, uh, the chances of acceptance. And again, we see that uh, we see pretty strong uh, uh, strong and linear relationship between the how many, um, uh, uh, and again, we see actually two, two ways to operationalize that. One is uh, whether it's a creator submitted or it's creator accepted. And both of these, uh, both of these factors uh, increase the chances of, uh, of acceptance uh, and, and increase the chances linearly. Now, uh, hypothesis four, characteristics of the PR review phase can have impact on the probability of acceptance, basically, if people uh, have comments, maybe it's a, a somewhat controversial PR. Uh, if reviews have comments, uh, again, uh, as we can see, having comments decreases the probability. Having review comments uh, increases the chances of acceptance, so people at least pay attention. And uh, as age increases, the uh, 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 chances of acceptance decrease. Now, if you look at the chart, you can see that actually up to 20 days the chances of acceptance don't change much, but they drop off pretty strongly once you reach that, uh, once you reach the age of 30 days. Uh, so basically anything older than 30 days, forget about it. Uh, you probably want to submit a new PR or do something else. Uh, hypothesis five 
is more experienced PR creators will have a higher chance of their PR accepted. And again, we measure experience by looking at the total commits of the creator, not just to the NPM projects, uh, but to all open source projects. And we measure both number of commits and number of different projects, repositories that a person participated. And again, we see increasing trend. Again, it doesn't look like to be very linear, but oh, uh, I'm almost 10 minutes uh, out. So um, I'll try to um, uh, finish off uh, in uh, within a minute or so. So track record of a repository as well, uh, whether or not uh, there was any PRs uh, submitted to the repository in the past and whether or not they, uh, the repository has accepted uh, something in the past also has a strong probability uh, chance of, of, of affecting the acceptance. And the final hypothesis we uh, tested was uh, dependence. So uh, if the projects that PR creator previously contributed to depend on the repository, to which the PR is being crea created, it's more likely to be accepted. So this is kind of supply chain concept that if you're sort of working not on another project, but the project depends on the project on which you presumably be fixing a bug library, uh, then the chances of acceptance increase. And indeed that's the case. Uh, finally, we uh, fitted a random forest model and got incredibly high uh, uh, AUC. Uh, we see that the age is the most important predictor in terms of mean decrease accuracy. And, uh, uh, and we, we can see that the repository, uh, uh, repository factors and other factors are also important. Um, just to uh, make sure uh, this is reproducible, we sort of uh, uh, share the data and here's the reference to that, uh, uh, as well as, as the code used to, to do it. And uh, in summary, uh, PR acceptance probability depends on characteristics of the PR, on the repository to which the PR is submitted, PR creators' experience and their social connection with the repository. And most of the uh, measures have actually nonlinear effect on PR acceptance probability. So uh, if you have any more questions, uh, please ask or email us. Thank you very much, Audrey, for uh, your uh, interesting talk. Um, there are several questions uh, in the chat I would like to ask. Uh, uh, Afnan al uh is curious about the choice of the ecosystem. Why NPM specifically? What features of NPM made you choose it? Well, uh, you know, I hate to say, but uh, uh, Part of it uh, is, in a way, uh, the size. Uh, it's the largest uh, ecosystem, uh, both in terms of, uh, definitely in terms of projects, but also uh, in terms of participants. Um, the second part is that uh, the, their package manager is, is, is somewhat better than, uh, than other uh, ecosystems package managers. So it's kind of easier to, uh, uh, to link the information uh, from various sources. And perhaps uh, another reason for that is that it's more uh, recent uh, convenience factors. Uh, so a lot of uh, projects there are not using mailing lists, for example, to to deal with issues, uh, but actually use GitHub or uh, issue tracker. So uh, in a way, so these were kind of uh, uh, to assure homogeneity of the, of the data. Um, uh, there are other things as well uh, is, is we kind of, uh, one of the things that we wanted to investigate actually, it didn't turn out to be the most important factor, but it was uh, important, was the, uh, the supply chain factor. And uh, that is the dependence between the packages actually affects the chances of acceptance. And, uh, um, and um, NPM is, is perhaps the most, uh, has the most complicated dependencies from that perspective. So at NPM, uh, people tend to less copy the code uh, and use it in their local directory and more rely on uh, depending on other packages. And that way we can, you know, we can really look at these dependencies more, more clearly. I'm not sure if I answered the question though. Thank you very much, Audrey. Uh, there is uh, another question from YouTube. You can answer it in StreamYard. Uh, and I would suggest uh, for us all to thank Audrey for his talk. Our next presenter is um, Edna Diaz-Canedo, 
who is going to talk to us about work practices and perception from women core developers in open source communities. Uh, Edna, can you please uh, start sharing your screen? It's okay, Sarmoni. Uh, I don't see your screen. It's okay? Uh, yes, now I can see it. Please go ahead. It's okay now? Hi, my name is Edna and uh, I'm going to present today a study about work practices and perceptions from women core developers in open source software communities. There are many research about the gender bias in open source communities. Nonetheless, little is known about the existence of vertical segregation in open source software communities. In this paper, we explore this issue of vertical segregation and study the work practices and perceptions of gender buyers from the point of view of the women core developers. So we answered four research questions. Question one, how common are women core developers in open source communities? Two, are there differences in the work practice of women or men core developers? Three, how do women core developers perceive gender diversity and gender bias in open source communities? And four, what are the actions women core developers consider important to make open source communities more inclusive? In the first two research questions, we address the issues of vertical segregation and work practices of core developers. In the third and fourth ones, we address the perceptions of women core developers on gender buyers. To answer these questions, we have used a mixed method study. First, we have used the GitHub API to search for the 100 most popular projects written in the 15 most popular program languages at GitHub to identify women core developers and to understand their work practice when contributing to open source communities. As we study core developers, we focus on sufficiently large projects with sufficiently many committers. To determine the trust roads, we compute the first quartiles of the... Edna, I apologize for interrupting you, but the slides are not changing. We, only, we still see the first slide. Ah, uh, okay, sorry. So. And uh, to determine the trust road, we compute okay, we compute the first quartiles of the distribution of source line of code and number the committers, and exclude projects have less source lines of code or less committers than the trust roads. In this way, we preserve 711 projects written in 14 languages with at least 5,183 source lines of code and 33 committers. We identified core developers using the notion of truck factory, and we have identified the gender of all developers using two gender identification tools, gender computer and Nensor. 
this table summary this this table present the summary of the data set with core developers in the second study we have served the women core developers we have identified in the first study to understand their perceptions about gender bias in open source communities we have identified 45 women core developers we could not confirm the gender of six of them moreover among the 39 women core developers three of them are core developers contributing to two projects in other data set so our target population has 36 women core developers we have contacted them by email over a period of three weeks we have received the answers from 35 of these developers among 711 github projects we have identified 1954 core developers 45 core developers are recognized as women while 1717 are were organized as men we found women core developers in 37 projects 2.3 percent of core developers identified was women in order that i said <clears throat> this finding suggests an wonder representation of women core developers in open source software communities we also explore two additional questions to better understand to work practices of women core developers how do the number frequency and size of contributions of women core developers compare with the number frequency and size of contributions of men core developers according we have mined the commit history from the 36 women core developers wcd and we randomly generated three data sets with men core developers mcd1 mcd2 mcd3 and have collected the commit history which one of these data sets comprise 36 men core developers regarding the size of the contributions we have computed the total lines of code and the number of files edited changed and deleted from the set of contributions of mcd1 2 3 and wcd no statistically significant difference could be observed Consider these results, we conclude that there is no difference in terms of number, frequency, and size of commutes with regards to the gender of core developers. In the second questions, we have used the approach of Hattori and Lanza to investigate the differences on the type of contributions of women core developers that differ the men core developers women core developers wcd contributes more with corrective and re-engineering activities while set of men core developers mcd contribute more with management activities and the ones that we were not uh, able to classify there is no much differences in the forward engineer activities regarding our second study the server uh, we found that women core developers are in general young 51.4 percent of the women are between 18 and 20 five years old and almost 80 percent of them are younger than 35 years old 68.6 percent of the women core developers consider gender diversity in open source communities to be very important according to them diverse uh, gender diversity can improve team communication and uh, attract uh, women even in a population of core developers, one third of the women believe that at least 
one of their contributions had not been accepted due to gender bias. Moreover, 11.4% often recognize gender bias while someone appraised their contributions. Gender bias appears whenever uh, contributions from women core developers receive less positive feedback. Gender bias also appears in open source community, community through the language used. Avoid gender pronouns. For example, we use in guys. It's very common and this gives an idea that it's assumed that contributors are mostly men. So modern language would help. There is the use of inadequate languages in open source software communities. The women core developers, the women core developers suggest to make open source software community more inclusive. One, promote women in specific mentor program. Two, promote women to senior roles. Three, organize women at specific events such as outreach, local meetups, or even tech groups. And four, avoid gender language, for instance, using guys. So, in summary, in this work, we have studied uh, different interpretations of gender bias in open source software communities. Our finds show that open source communities present both horizontal and vertical segregation. Only 2.3% of the core developers are women. This group of women core developers contribute in a similar fashion as, as water groups of men core developers, considering frequency and size of contributions. The last but not the least, women core developers believe that gender diversity is very important in open source software community. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Edna. We have uh, a question uh, in the chat. Um, how did you identify women developers from the whole population? As um, Jefferson said, the Maleri says that as far as uh, they know, GitHub users are not required to state their gender in the platform. We identified the core developers by the two, two uh, gender computer and Nancer. And the the women is not uh, able to classify. We classified by um, men or method. Well, maybe I can comment that gender computer and NAMSOR are based on names. Ah, okay. But they interpret names uh, through the gender lens. Um, if you have more questions, please go ahead and uh, post them on Facebook or on uh, YouTube. And if not, let us speak, let us thank Edna again. In any case, uh, Edna is around, so she can always answer questions on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, our next speaker uh, is um, Denise Martinez Majorado. I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Uh, Denise is working at Stevens Institute of Technology in the United States, and she's going to talk to us about uh, the study on patterns and effect of task diversity in software crowdsourcing. Yeah, okay, can you have your seen my slides? Yep. Okay. No. Hello, everyone. Um, Today I'm going to talk about the study on patterns and effect of task diversity in software crowdsourcing. Myself, Denise Martinez, uh, Rasia Saremi, Ji Yang, and Jose Ramirez Marquez uh, work in this research. Um, I'm going to go, uh, just to give you a, a look of what we're going to talk today, I'm going to go to the introduction. How is that we get to these diversity patterns? Uh, the research design, the empirical results, and the discussion. Um, it is important to notice that decisions regarding to crowdsource a software task usually involves organizational and technical factors 
knowledge and expertise and the size of the crowd pool. From a task requester perspective, there is also risk. Uh, for example, the uncertainty on both the number of trustworthiness of registrants and the quality of the received submissions. Existing studies reveal 82.9% of task dropping rate, uh, which leads to 15.7% of crowdsourcing failure. This is why it is very uh, essential to develop better understanding and how sensitivity in worker performance and task outcome under different competition circumstances. Also, um, it is relevant to know that in a competitive CSD platform, there are two competitions, open tasks among other open tasks and workers versus other workers. And, and just to give an example, for example, in February 2014, uh, in top coded platform, we saw 169 open tasks, 56 were similar in more than 60%, and each task had an average of 21 registrations and only two submissions. Well, the workers, we had 460 registered to some of the open tasks and only 156 submit their work. I'm gonna go through um, an example on how is that we uh, identify the patterns. So um, top coder, we were with this data set from uh, January 2014 to February 2015. We had around 5,000 tasks. And then we create task attributes, for example, the price, the days to register, technologies, platforms, uh, number of links, etc. And then for each month, these were 14 months, we did an unsupervised clustering uh, where we ranked each cluster based on the average number of registrations. And then we perform a decision tree classification and identify that the dominant attributes were price and complexity. This is the, the, the decision to register um, to a task from the workers were mostly this price and complexity. So after, I then, after analyzing the 14 months cluster, so each, uh, each dot, it is a task. And what, as I said, we um, rank them. And for example, we found these three patterns. Responsive to price. In this case, we have price and complexity. And in blue, we have uh, where the competition level was higher. This is, it receives a higher number of registrations. And then we have in yellow, the ones with uh, lower uh, number of registrations and so on. So in this case, what we observe in this pattern is that if the price was higher, they were gonna receive more uh, registrations and so on. So in this case, what we said is that the workers were responsive to price and it follows a price order. Then we found a second pattern that we call responsive to price and complexity. In this case, again, we have the blue that has the, um, the highest um, competition level. In this case, it has higher price and lower complexity. And then the second, for example, the second cluster in yellow, you can see that it has higher high price, but also high complexity. So what we observe is that the um, workers were basing their decisions based on price and complexity. And then we identify a third pattern that we call over-responsive to price. So in this time period, it is usually when we observe that a uh, task with a very high price or at least uh, high from the average um, appears and, and then like this kind of uh, pull all the, <laughs> all, the, all the workers and they have more and they, these are the more competitive tasks. So how can we understand this from a conceptual um, uh, model? So we have a time that we call, this can be a month, and we have this task description, and task description that we translate into task attributes, and then we identify these task dominant attributes. We identify uh, the competition level, as I said, that this, this was a number of registrations, and then we identify the uh, diversity patterns. And then we also, we need to see the task similarity among open tasks. This is because we want to compare tasks um, that are similar. And we get into three uh, questions. One is how do different task diversity pattern configurations distribute in a competitive CSD? Question number two, how does different task diversity patterns um, impact task success? 
And with uh, task success, we're talking about task density, task stability, and task failure. And question number three, how does different task diversity patterns impact on worker performance? And with this, we uh, check into workers' reliability and workers' trustworthiness. Uh, so just to summarize, as I said, we identify these three uh, patterns, what we call responsive to price, RP, is when competition level follows a price order. The second one, responsive to price and complexity, RPC, when competition level follows both price and task complexity order. And over responsive to price, when there's few tasks uh, with a monetary price above the average as outliers, and these attract the highest competition level. The data set that we work is from Tocoder. It, is, um, it contains about uh, 5,000 um, 5, tasks and has information of more than 8,000 workers. It is from January 2014 to February 2015. And as I was talking to you that we extract the task attributes, for example, we have days for registration, uh, days from registration to submission, the duration, the monetary price, the task complexity. In this case, we use the number of leaks in task description. Uh, link count, that is the number of leaks in task description, the technologies, the platforms, the number of platforms, the number of technologies. And we also work on a task difficulty index because we wanted to capture um, a little bit more how, how difficult was the task in terms of technologies, in terms of the of what was requested. And then to um, analyze the task outcome, we had the task status, the registration, submissions, and valid submissions. So this is a summary of what we did. As I said, we had this um, data set from Top Coder, and we did some data filtering and pre-processing, and then we did the clustering. So we had the unsupervised clustering, then we ranked these clusters. Then we identify the dominant attributes and we identify these uh, task diversity patterns. And this will give us an answer to how was the diversity patterns distributed through the different months. Then we perform a similarity analysis. And then we uh, study task success and worker performance to answer question number two and three. So the results for question number one, in this case, we, uh, we were studying how these task diversity patterns were over the this time period and what we found is that responsive to price pattern was found in february march april may and july of 2014 responsive to price and complexity uh, was found in january 2014 december 2014 and 15 and february 2015 and over responsive to price was found in june august september october november 2014 and january 2015. so in general what we saw is that in the first half of the year we had responsive to price and over responsive to price was found in the second semester of the year while responsive to price and complexity was less frequent we only found it in three months and question number two uh, was regarding task success and we studied task density, task stability, and task failure. Uh, unfortunately, or, uh, for task density and task stability, we didn't have a significant difference between these three patterns. And it was only uh, significant for task failure. So do that we have like a uh, short time. So I'm gonna go and talk about task failure. And what we found is with tasks that are similar from 60 to 80%, we found that the configuration of responsive to price and complexity presents the lower um, failure task failure ratio. And from 80 to 90 percent, uh, we found that the best was responsive to price. And for uh, question number three, we were studying also worker performance through worker reliability and worker trust. So in this case, we could not conclude uh, much because also the, um, there was no significant difference between these three patterns. Um, some of the limitations and threats to validity. So the study focuses only on competitive CSD tasks on top coder platform. We work with about 5,000 tasks, 
but results cannot be claimed externally valid. And we work with known task attributes. There are different factors that influence task similarity, task diversity patterns, and workers' decisions in task selection in a competition. So results are only based on the study of task. And the takeaway from this talk is that this analysis benefit the cross-sourcing development platforms by contributing to understand the behaviors under which tasks are successful. Um, also, this study considers the time dynamic, understanding the past and current reactions of workers to the task supply in a time period. And in future, we would like to test the scalability of our findings. Um, so this is my email if you have further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Denise. Let, let us um, take a look at the questions from the chat. Um, yes, so there is a question from uh, Andrea Vescan. Are there any dependencies or correlations between the considered tasks attributes? Yes. Um, yes, we can say that, for example, more complex tasks, we expect that have higher price. Um, so yeah, definitely there are uh, different, uh, there, there must be correlations. I have another short question. Mm -hmm. How do you explain this uh, sensibility to price in the first half of the year and over responsiveness to price in the second half of the year? Does this mean like people don't have any money anymore and they become extra sensitive? Um, I'm actually not sure. Like at this moment, it is kind of hard to, to answer that. Um, but I don't know if by the end of the year there is like more um, um, more um, necessity of more, like there is more incentive to finish some projects. So this may explain um, this may explain this, but I'm I'm not I don't have an answer right now. So yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you again, Denise. Thank you. And uh, our um, next and last speaker of this session is uh, Chong Wang uh, from uh, Wuhan University in China. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about what industry wants from requirements engineers in China, an exploratory and comparative study on requirements engineering job ads. And the speaker seems to have vanished. Yes. Let us wait for a couple of uh, minutes. The speaker probably experiencing some kind of technical problems. Um, okay. In the meantime, uh, yes. So the speaker is here. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Chong Wang. Can you please share Hi. your screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait a moment. Okay. Here it is. It's okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So, hello everyone. I'm Chung Wang from Wuhan University, China. Our work is an exploration and comparative study on what industry wants from requirements engineers in China based on online RE jobs. Here are the topics I will come to. First, the background. As we know, uh, the RE tasks and the skills have been uh, elaborated in uh, RE textbooks and uh, the teachers of RE courses in many universities teach students on RE practices that align with these books. But in industry, RE practitioners are used to create their own RE-related tasks and skills, not only reflecting their uh, specific understanding on RE roles, but also the demands of specific businesses. Then we have a question, are the RE tasks and skills in textbooks the same as that in industry? The empirical studies on these topics in Mexico and Brazil, Germany, the Netherlands, and Canada have concluded that there is a gap between RE practices in industry 
and in RE textbooks. However, prior studies uh, were not from the perspective of RE activities, nor they shed light on the industry needs of RE professionals in China. Uh, we all know that Asia has the world's biggest labor market. However, the RE profession in this market, such as Chinese market, um, is under-researched. Uh, we felt motivated to understand what Chinese employees demand from RE professionals by identifying qualifications and experience sought after as per RE job ads in China. The research goal of our paper is to investigate the demands of RE roles in China's job market from the perspective of five RE activities identified in the SWE book. And we formulate uh, three research questions. Uh, first, what job titles are set for RE roles? And second, what are uh, tasks are requested for RE positions in China and which RE activities defined in, in those book are supported by these tasks? And the third question, what competencies are needed for RE roles in China? To investigate the demands of RE roles in China's job market, we choose two of the largest and also the most popular job search portals. Uh, these two portals as the pool for our uh, exploration. And, and we use um, the word uh, requirements engineer and its three alliances as the four keywords to conduct the auto uh, search of RE related job ads in these two portals. And the research returned a total of 5,224 uh, job ads. Next, we use a sample size calculator to calculate how many job ads are um, presentative for our exploration. The results show that uh, at least uh, uh, around uh, 900 job ads should be included in the sample. So we select uh, 1,000 job ads uh, as the raw data set. And after the manual analysis, we got a final set of uh, 535 job ads for code extraction and analysis in this study. Uh, here's the results. First is uh, the answers to uh, research question one. Uh, we identified 20 types of job titles identified in our uh, job ads and grouped these uh, titles into five categories. And we also find that in China's job market, manager is the largest category uh, covering six job ads and uh, job titles. Uh, for the second research question, uh, first, in this paper, we considered uh, these five uh, RE activities in, in SWE book. And these two tables shows the RE tasks identified uh, for requirements elicitation and uh, requirements validation, uh, for example. This slide summarized the 23 tasks identified in the five RE activities. And also we reported top 10 in demand RE tasks in the job ad set. And the top two in demand RE tasks are requirements documentation in requirements specification activity and requirements analysis and organization in requirements analysis activity. As for the third research question, uh, we found that RE experience is the most demand RE competence and uh, other industry experience and the soft skills uh, seem to be the two most demanded non-RE competencies. 
finally, we compared our findings to those. Of our study on RE jobs in Canada in 2017, and、um, you can see that different number of categories of job titles、uh, were reported in these two countries, and、uh, also we found that the job title requirements engineer was only reported in China.、Um, after a comparison on RE tasks. We found that、uh, in the、uh, RE activity requirement validation, there is no similar or the same task in China and Canada. But for the other four RE task、uh, activities, at least one similar RE tasks in both China and Canada. This table compared the RE and the non-RE competencies over countries, and we find that. Uh, in China, uh, uh, considering the RE competence,、uh, China pay more attention to、uh, RE experience and RE tools, but Canada pay more attention to、uh, RE method. As for non-RE competence, China pay less attention to other methods,、uh, other project management knowledge, etc. Here are some limitations of our work. Uh, first, uh, as we mentioned,、uh, we only use the requirements engineer and its three lines as the keywords to do the automatic search, uh, and uh, we only select one thousand、uh, job ads and to, and to form the initial data set for、uh, our manual analysis. So it、uh, was where. And to look in job ads with more titles and to give a、um, broad understanding on RE job、uh, RE roles in practice.、Uh, next, we know that、uh, in reality, some job related to RE roles would never appear in portals.、Uh, for example,、uh, some seasoned IT specialist has their own professional network. And in China, internal recommendation and campus recruitment are the two popular ways to inform job seekers. So we think that more research is needed to completely understand the company's expectation of professionals at these RE positions and roles. Then the conclusions. First,、uh, our paper is the first study. To provide an empirical analysis of RE job ads in China from the perspective of RE activities, also we compared the RE and job ads expect of China with that in Canada.、Uh, the conclusions、uh, first, we found that RE requirement、uh, RE engineer is indeed used for RE roles in China. And、uh, these three RE tasks are the top three task related qualifications.、Uh, also,、uh, having RE experiences is identified as the most important competence in China job market. And、uh, finally, we compared our findings with that in Canada, and、uh, we reported different concerns、uh, on RE and non RE competencies. In those two countries, and the future work. First, we would like to collect and analyze more job ads from the two protocols or the other popular job websites in China. And second, we plan to conduct a survey and to investigate the gap between practitioners and educators on the RE task and skills reported in this study. And、uh, finally, we would like to conduct a comparative evaluation of the results、uh, from the other countries in the related work. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Chong.、Uh, we have a couple of questions for you. Andrea Biscan wonders about differences between、uh, university-based、uh, education in terms of requirements engineering 
and the impact of this university education on the job market. Can you comment on this? Um... So, um, based on the results, uh, I mean the uh, RE tasks and uh, the competence we uh, find in the RE jobs, we also uh, uh, do some uh, surveys and uh, uh, formulate some questionnaire for the master and bachelor students to uh, select to vote which uh, the, the importance of the RE uh, competencies and we got some results and found that there there is some differences between uh, what we found in the uh, IE jobs and what uh, the students get from the courses. Uh, so we think that uh, maybe we can uh, do something to uh, help the students uh, get more knowledge or experience uh, to catch up the uh, demands from uh, of industries yeah um i have an, uh, another question so thank you very much for comparing uh the chinese study and the canadian study but how can you explain the differences between the two uh, sorry where's the question how can, you the explain, qu oh. how can you explain the differences between the two uh, you mean the findings um, between China between and Canada. China is Canada, right? Yes, yes. Um, because uh, these two studies are done by ourselves, and uh, we uh, it's more convenient uh, in for us to do this work and minimize the constructor uh, validity uh, threats, and uh, we. We compared uh, the common results from these two countries, uh, and in the near future, we would like to compare more results. But uh, you know that not all the work done by us, and we cannot get all the uh, the full information for the comparison. So uh, there might be some uh, uh, more work to do to compare the work. Thank you very much for your answer. And the last question is coming uh, from uh, Jefferson, Jefferson Fede Molieri, who is asking whether you plan to extend this comparison to other jobs, like testers. Mm. Or do you want to focus only on requirements engineering, but then in different mm. countries? Currently, we, uh, it, it, it's not in our plan, but uh, in the future, Maybe we can do it, yeah. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much for the presentation. Um, dear participants, uh, as you might have noticed, we had uh, four talks in this uh, session uh, about social aspects and work practices instead of five. This is because the paper about teamwork quality and team success in software development unfortunately could not be presented. Um, we also have not received the video, so unfortunately we cannot play it. However, um, I uh, would strongly encourage you uh, to read this paper if you are interested in uh, the topic of um, teamwork and in terms of working practices. I actually read this paper myself and I really liked it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. This concludes uh, our session. And as far as I understand, it also concludes the second day of uh, SM. Uh, and of course, see you all tomorrow. Goodbye.